sides of the coin here. So their foolish and darkened hearts and their futile thoughts can further suppress the truth in unrighteousness and exchange it for a lie. That's why they preach a different gospel. Mixed up and interweaving with all this terminology that you can't find in the pages of Scripture, but is confirmed by the spirit of error guiding them in their carnal minds. Some of the examples of this stuff that we speak, I, I have, I've had a few I just renumerated there. Finished work, imputed righteousness. See, these things aren't found in the scriptures, but you'll hear people writing them on the blogs and, and raising them as though they invalidate everything else the scripture says. The finished work of Jesus Christ. What they mean by this is that he provided a substitution for man where he took the wrath of God in their place and obeyed for them, fulfilling all the righteous requirements of the law by proxy. That's what they mean. You trust in that, and then you're saved, pronounced righteous, dead to the law, and the, and the requirements of the law, and the consequences of the law. You're dead to it, like we talked about in our dead to the law lesson a little while back. That's what they've done. So, in other words, under this system, then, you're imputed righteousness, the imputed righteousness of Christ. Surely faith is imputed as righteousness, but faith is faithfulness and steadfastness and obedience and steadiness in the word, in, you know, command, obeying the commandments of God. Like Abraham walked in the steps of faith, he did the deeds of faith in James, steps of faith in Romans. He obeyed God in Hebrews. That was his faith. That's imputed as righteousness. But no, they say his righteousness is imputed to you. Nowhere found in Scripture. You can't find that in Scripture anywhere where it says Christ is imputed to you as righteousness or that his finished work on the cross becomes your obedience in the fulfillment of something that you can't do. So he actually then he has to become sin, receive your punishment, pay your debt in full, like old Ray Comfort and Way of the Master people like to talk about, which is total complete nonsense. Then his personal righteousness and his obedience, his perfect obedience, is transferred to this trusting soul that comes up here and repeats some words, all by faith, and then all your sin, past, present, and future is blotted out as though it never happened. You're justified in a forensic manner, pronounced not guilty, although you continue in your wretched man condition and your Romans wretch and all the rest of it, Christ paid it all in advance for you. Done deal. If that's not seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, I don't know what is. If that's not what we're supposed to cast down and, and bring into the captivity of a Christ and to expose his error and contend for the faith against these things, I don't know what is. But your pastors are not going to do this because they're under the same lie. Then, of course, it's by all by faith alone. Faith alone, why? Well, because even though that's not found in Scripture, the exact opposite, of course, found in Scripture. Man's not saved by faith alone. Man's, man's saved by what he does and not by faith alone in James 2.24. So they base the whole thing on this faith alone thing under moral depravity because you can't do anything. It's all been paid in advance for you, the finished work of Jesus Christ again. As though when he said it's finished on the cross, that means that, that uh, all you got to do is... That. Why didn't he tell people in the Gospels when they ask him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why didn't he tell them, well, trust in my finished work on the cross? No, he told them to love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and neighbor as herself, and on that hung all the law and the prophets, and love fulfills the law. That's what he told them, and that's what it says throughout the New Testament. Keeping the commandments of God is what matters. A new creation in Christ is what matters. It's not circumcision or uncircumcision, but it's a keeping the commandments of God. It's a new creation. That's, why didn't he tell them that? That just trust in my finished work. And then you just have a simple expression of faith, believe, right? John 3.16, he that believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, the devils believe, too. That's the same word for believe, James 2.19. That's the kind of faith that they're passing off under these doctrines of demons, these false spirits. He did it all for you. You do nothing. It's not a works. Although none of this is found in the Scriptures. Like I've always said, if it's, if it's entirely not of works or any kind of deeds whatsoever, why constantly saying, bring forth deeds worthy of repentance? Why did Jesus say it? Why did John the Baptist say it? Why did Paul say it? Why did Peter say it? And why does John say in Revelation in the final chapter that you'll be judged according to your deeds? Because that's the truth. And all of it's based on the foundation. That's the, that's the cornerstone or the block, the foundation block. Total depravity. 
which means that you're born in this state of total depravity, you can't obey God, you can't do what's right, you have no ability. All that's the lie. The acronym TULIP, none of that's in the Bible under that false doctrine that the Westminster Confession and almost every creed and confession and statement of faith throughout the church system is loosely based on this so-called TULIP, which is what moral depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints, which is eternal security, as we call it in our language today. None of those things said anywhere in the scriptures. None of the words that say the unconditional election in the scripture. It doesn't say limited atonement anywhere. It doesn't say irresistible grace and moral depravity. None of those things. I know they can imply that this scripture says it and this scripture, and they've got neat little ways of doing it, but they're handling the word of God deceitfully by doing that. But still, again, that's what you've submitted yourself to under this Babylonian system, this lie that you're sitting under in these churches, this doctrines of demons. Can you imagine Jesus walking around, telling people that they're totally depraved, that they're unable to obey his commands, and all you got to do is finish, trust in my finished work on the cross to inherit eternal life. As I just said, that everybody that came to him in the instances in the scriptures, he told them to love God, keep his commandments, and then you'll inherit eternal life. And if you teach people not to keep his commandments, you won't be part of his kingdom. But that's what they're doing. The spirits have been able to convince the people almost the entire professing Christian world is under this thing that you don't have to obey him. You don't have to keep his commandments, that he did it for you. Surely it's it really is, like he said there in Galatians passage, it's really as though an angel from heaven has come down and told everybody that the teachings of Jesus no longer have any relevance and other than they're just allegories of some symbolic representation of a perfect life lived out so that nobody can attain to it, but do we just stand back and admire it as his finished work done in our place? That's pretty much the way they look at this. That's why they don't preach Jesus' gospel, the narrow way, the strive to enter, take up your cross. They, they don't preach it that way. So instead of let no one deceive you, he that does what is right is righteous, as he is righteous, and he who sins is of the devil, in 1 John 3, 7 and 8. You're just as righteous as he's righteous, the righteousness you need, unless your righteousness exceeds that of scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom. So what righteousness is he talking about? He's talking about obeying him, he who does what is right. Righteous as he is righteous. Not self-righteous, but no, no, what is it under the line? Under the lie, it's nobody's righteous, nor can anybody do what's right, and he who sins inherits the kingdom. That's total reverse. That's what they t teach him. That's why the faith, in the faith alone and the moral depravity angle that we just said, the, the things that aren't found in the scriptures anywhere, that's why it works so well. They just ignore the words of Christ and teach him as the babe in the manger that they sing about and have their pageants on Christmas, but they never obey what he said. And they never tell the people that they have to obey. See, their salvation is based on a system of term, terms that are not found in the Scripture or anywhere else. They're not found in the teachings of Jesus or anywhere else in the Bible. That's what I mean to say. See, they sit in their churches and they mimic these things in their nonsensical absurdities that uh, make the seducing spirits rejoice in glee that people could actually be so stupid as to believe the reverse, the absolute reverse of Scripture, and then feel safe under their delusion that they're okay with God. But their doom is summarized in 2 Thessalonians chap chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, where it talks about the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, everything. The, de the, the, re the rhetoric and the wisdom and the signs and the dream, all that stuff. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, why they perish?